John, I know you hate when I do that. You're shaking your head. But you know what? Tell me again what's on this week's episode. So this week, it's so unprofessional to do that. <laughs> what, do what, you think this podcast is professional? This is, I mean, but at least we should at least try to make it like sound okay. Okay, <laughs> fine. Let's do a podcast. podcast. Let's do a podcast. podcast. Let's do a podcast. About Charlotte. Let's do a podcast. podcast. Let's do a podcast. podcast. Let's do a podcast. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of the Charlotte Podcast. This is John. And this is Miller in this episode 236. John, what's on this week's episode? So this week, we speak to Pat Whalen and Chef Jamie Lynch, two of the co-founders of the Fifth Street Group. Uh, we hear about their uh, story in Charlotte and beyond, and then uh, uh, some really interesting stuff they're doing uh, uh, that, that has had some great early returns in the restaurant game. Um, and then we'll hop into some cheers and jeers, which I think is officially our new segment to end yep. podcast. So far, I, so good. I feel like you gave up on the fact. And now it's just cheers and jeers. I, I only because I enjoy the cheers and jeers. That's more than, I think it's more fun. That is fair. Um, if you're listening to us, please leave a rating or review. Share it with others. Tell other people. We're really bad about it. We don't really post that much on social media, which we should. And you should follow us on at CLT Podcast. Um, but I tell you what, John, we have a great interview coming up. They are far more interesting than us just chatting. So let's just go ahead and hop into our interview. When we get back, we'll be talking to two of the guys from the Fifth Street Group. The Charlotte Podcast is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Now offering video visits so you can take control of your orthopedic care from the comfort of your home. Schedule online at orthocarolina.com. Ortho Carolina, you improved. All right. We are here with Pat Whalen and Chef Jamie Lynch, co founders, 66.6% of the Fifth Street Group. So welcome, Pat. Hi. And Chef Jamie, welcome to the Charlotte Podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. All right. Uh, well, uh, as we were just chatting about, um, I'm I'm super excited to have you guys on. Uh, have have uh, been a fan of you guys, watching you guys' success from afar for the past couple of years in, in Charlotte and beyond. Um, so excited to get into kind of the story of the past couple of years for you guys and, and the impact you've had on on Uptown and giving me personally options <laughs> to to uh, uh, go with my coworkers and and family and friends. Um, uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. And then obviously anybody in you guys' positions, uh, restaurateurs and and kind of in the food service industry in general, it's been quite a year for you guys. And I think the the impetus for saying, hey, we'd love to, to dive a little deeper with you guys has been um, uh, some, some commentary and stuff you guys have been thinking about and new models and things like that that I'm, I'm really interested in. Because I think um, the pandemic has been uh, uh, a struggle for the industry and a lot of people, um, but it's, it's really interesting to hear uh, and see guys like yourselves think about what the future could look like. And I think that's what we want to get into here. But first things first. We want to start with each of you guys on the story um, of, of what brought you to Charlotte. So we'll uh, we'll try to go one and the other, and we'll switch back and forth uh, and try to keep keep the listeners uh, up to speed what's going on. But uh, yeah. so we'll start with Pat. So what's your Charlotte story, man? Like, how did you come to be in Charlotte? Uh, I moved here when I was 15, um, and I went to high school um, from 15 to 18, 19. Um, and then I moved to, I went to college and I moved to New York after college. And uh, I was in restaurants the whole time that I was there. I met my wife and um, we're having a, a dog fight over here, literally. <laughs> it um, happens. <laughs> um, but uh, my, I met my wife. Uh, we were got married, pregnant with our first. And we decided that New York City was not where we wanted to be. I got a job offer to move back to Charlotte, um, which was ideal for me. My parents were already here. Um, and so we made the move back and, and I started a nightclub called Butter NC, which OG Charlotte people might recognize, but unfortunately that was a long time ago now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then, you know, down the road, I met 
Jamie, and uh, we got started with the Fifth Street Group. So prodigal son story. You're you're from here. You left and you came back. I feel like the prodigal son was kind of an <laughs> asshole, though. <I> don't <laughs> he, he really was. was. I mean, I, I mean, that's I more of like the location. Yeah, I was, I was focused more on the location shifting, so <laughs> not not necessarily the morality. But uh, okay. We totally <laughs> misread that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I was pretty upset with my boy. Do I take that so personally? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can see how you'd make that leap, but <laughs> take taking the spirit was intended. Uh, all right, so uh, Chef Jamie, how about yourself? What's your what's your story? Uh, so my Charlotte story um, started um, around September 11th, 2001. I was cooking in New York City um, in a three-star restaurant on Union Square right off of 15th Street um, called Tocqueville um, when the whole you know, 9-11 disaster happened there, the attacks and everything. Um, so you know, my world shifted at that point um, from you know, chefing at, you know, this upscale restaurant to cooking for rescue workers. Mm. Uh, and, um, and it, it really, I mean, I was pretty devastated at that point. I didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, living in New York at that time was, um, super depressing. Um, you know, no, no idea when things would return to normal. Yeah. Uh, not that, not that different from kind of what we went through <laughs> last year, actually. Right. <laughs> but like prepped for, for a disaster, but, um, yeah. But anyways, um, you know, I cooked for rescue workers for about three months in the city and decided that I needed to to get out of there. I had to make a move, um, try to restart my life somewhere and get back to, you know, my passion of cooking. Um, and one of my best friends, uh, best friends uh, lived in Gastonia. Um, and I I'd visited Charlotte once um, years before yeah. his wedding and kind of fell in love with it. I was like, you know what? Threw all my stuff in the back of the Caprice Classic and like, Nice. The road. Yeah, I just showed up and was like, bro, I need a couch. And uh, <laughs> that was my Charlotte origin. A, uh, a Caprice classic headed towards Gastonia is where all greatness the begins. The am addiction. <laughs> yeah. like you guys don't know this, but classic started. Yeah. They all started and they all ended in Gastonia. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a well, circle of life for that's like bingo for this podcast. The free space is mentioned in Gastonia. As, as someone who grew up there, I always bring it into this podcast somehow. So we've now checked that. <laughs> like, off. like three minutes in, we already well, checked that box. So, so, yeah. so later during our conversation, you'll learn that I actually, me and my girlfriend started a farm in South Gastonia. So Very that, interesting. A little bit later, yeah. So Gastonia is going to be a recurring theme. Here. If uh, if if Fred Durst milks your cows, then uh, we we've hit we have bingo already. <laughs> uh, uh, so so how did you guys link up? Like, so you're both in Charlotte, kind of New York transplants, uh, uh, or recently from New York. So how did you guys wind up meeting, and and what's the origins of the history group? Well, I think the. So I, I guess the idea started somewhere um, in, in the butter days. Um, Pat and Alejandro were um, working with Mills at Butter. I think Pat had scribbled some notes on a napkin or something like that. I don't know if we still have the napkin, do we? No. Is it gone? Yes. Yeah, I think it would be worth some money these days. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on to that. But anyways, the napkin, um, you know, he started scribbling some notes about, um, you know, what they were going to do next. And... Um, I think the the idea stemmed from all of us at some point had been, or for all of our careers, had been making other people money or making other people successful, and um, and not really getting, um, not really getting what's the, what an opportunity, the, yeah, and like an opportunity to move up or an opportunity to do more. Mm. I think that's kind of what started the napkin drawing. Um, and I think once, once they decided they, they wanted to do something of their own, um, they had the skill set to do it. They had the drive to do it. They had the intelligence to do it. Um, they tracked me down. I was, uh, you know, cooking around in, in Charlotte, kind of restarting my life, um, you know, working my way through Charlotte kitchens. Yeah. I think that's kind of how we met. Yeah. And I think so. I sold a motorcycle, I think, to Mills. Yes. Yeah. Was, was how we actually made the connection. I sold my Ducati. <laughs> to Mills. And that's it. And he was like, hey, by the way, you want to do a restaurant or yeah. something? 
se <laughs> selling a Ducati happens to also be a square on the bingo. So uh, <laughs> lucky, lucky guess. Lucky yeah, guess. We're going we're yeah. to win this game. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so Five Church is is you guys' first venture, right? Or, or was there something before that? Uh, as as our group, it was our first, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good deal. Um, so that starts. Uh, I uh, I actually went to the place on Fifth and Church uh, before you guys moved in, and I believe it was like a Scottish whiskey bar or something like that. Is that right? Colin McPherson's. Yeah, that's right. I I remember being there, and like the lights were on on like a Friday <laughs> night uh, at 10 p.m. and I was like. This uh this place could be something different. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so so please you guys see you guys enter that space. Um, so kind of like how does that get going? You guys you guys start place. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it was like overnight success. Did you guys per like from from my point of view? I would say it was. It seemed like all of a sudden you guys were there, and it was like you had NASCAR drivers there. But that's that's my kind of outside looking in. But take us through that that process. What was it like? Mm -hmm. Kind of standing up and. Yeah, I think we 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 were more successful than we in initially anticipated from day one. Um, now, as to how fast we were a, a success, I mean, it, it happened pretty quickly. Uh, we 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 source or we, we we trace a lot of our success back to the NC, yeah, which mm -hmm. uh, was yeah, and then that was in September of 2012 and we opened in May, but we were already, even prior to the DNC, we were, we were already, we had a lot of buzz. We were definitely very hot. Um, and then the DNC just took a, took a something that was already on its way and really just went supersonic. We had, you know, we had a lot of famous people and politicians and we really became kind of the, the toast of the town, so to speak. And, and so that was the, that was the, but once that was over by Christmas, it was completely insane. I mean, yeah. we, we we were off to the race. Yeah, it was really we we had to figure out how to deal with the <laughs> <laughs> deal with it well. That was I a mean, real thanks Obama uh, moment. <laughs> yeah, I thought we, we we dealt with it all right. We dealt with it all right. I mean, the volume emotionally, I'm not sure. We yeah, that's what that's about. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying we yeah. still yeah. experience some spots. Yeah, some, yeah. Yeah. Still yeah. sorting yeah. through it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's fair. This is bad. Um, really had a good point. Yeah. So wait. Uh, so I think I have a hyper specific question about about Five Church. Um, is there a story between the art of war being written on the ceiling? Because I like, was like the first thing I noticed when I walked walked in the first time. So what's what's kind of the story there? You want so do you want the real story or do you want yeah no yeah, the real story <laughs> the real story is we ran out of money yeah. to to, <laughs> to, treat, to treat the to treat the ceiling. You know I think that's awesome. I think we. You know, in the design, if you know you're familiar with the restaurant, every surface and every corner has a treatment to it. You know, we've thought about placement of furniture, types of furniture, textures, colors, shapes, and everything um, to really bring that ambiance of the of the room to make it super dynamic. Um, and honestly, by the time we got to like the ceiling, it was the the funds were gone. Man, we were like, what are you gonna yeah. do? Um, I don't know who, who came up with the actual idea. So, so doing the book. our business partner at the time, Mills Howell, who Jamie was referring to, um, he, he had the idea to maybe have a, a massive art piece on the ceiling. And I think he had suggested, let's have, let's, let's scribble, let's scribble like the madness of like a, of a, a prisoner. I think yeah. Like the said. words of a madman, <laughs> somebody going insane or something. And I was like, that sounds really like interesting, but very dark. Yeah, yeah. A little, a little yeah. Unnerving, like maybe not right for a restaurant. Yeah. Right. Murder <laughs> while being terrified is not yeah. really the, the effect. <laughs> That's not the ambiance you're trying to create. I mean, right. I guess some people would be drawn to that, but we weren't. Most people. Like <laughs> so, but then we we were like, well, what if what if we did a book? You know, what if what if we could find a text that really worked? And um, I, I I love the book The Art of War. I think it's fascinating. Um, I think it's an incredible reference even thousands of years later. Um, and there was a specific passage in the Art of War that said um, something along the lines of, to expand your territories, you must divide the spoils. And that's actually featured promise, prominently, that quote is at all the ceilings where we had the Art of War. Uh, mm. Like Jamie said, we, we felt 
at that point in our careers that we were lacking the opportunity to really uh, do anything of our own because we were working for other people and hmm. those other people were not as willing to share the, the spoils of their expansion. And so we made it happen ourselves. And so that, that book and that line kind of became rallying cries for us along with there's only we um, towards uh, a, a business identity, a cultural identity for us. Well, we don't, we don't normally hit uh, thematic points like that on our podcast. We're a little more scattershot, but uh, <laughs> that we stumbled into that one. So, so yeah. take us, take us through um, the, like fast forward through what is probably the most interesting part for you guys, certainly the expansion kind of Charleston, like you guys' other restaurants, like real quick, because then I, I want to get to kind of the past year and what's made you think about the model. But kind of bring, yeah. bring us up to speed yeah. on the number of restaurants and stuff. Yeah, asking and I'll do it quick. Ready? Right. So after Five Church, we opened Nana Byron's the South End. It's currently called Rosemont. Um, yep. Nana Byron's was the embodiment of our immaturity as a group. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was really great. It offered a lot of really um, great products. And I think the idea was strong. Um, but we as a group were not mature enough yet to figure out how to make it work consistently. Um, and so we ended up selling it. We opened Five Church Charleston a couple of years later. It took two years of withering abuse from from locals, honestly. Yeah, the uh, Charleston before, locals were, they tough. were tough on us. Yeah. Um, the the <laughs> limit sets to get into that market's pretty high. And so we 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 got over that hump and and then it went supersonic and it's just been it's it's the highest grossing restaurant in our group. Um, hmm. Uh, I, you know, we're doing numbers now that I can't even wrap my head around. Um, we opened Five Church Atlanta in Atlanta. Uh, we had a falling out with a partner there. And so we sold our interests and got out of there. And we've been in one level of litigation with that partner or another for like three years, hopefully it'll end fairly soon. Um, we opened uh, Sophia's Lounge in Charlotte, which yep. um, was part of the Ivy's Hotel Complex. And we got the opportunity to open that. That's been a lot of fun. Um, we did, yeah, we've done a lot of stuff. Um, just keep going. We did, uh, <laughs> what else did we do? We did Tempest. Oh yeah. Tempest was, Tempest. was, the, was the big one recently we opened. It's a seafood restaurant in Charleston. Um, we won best new restaurant in the country, according to USA Today, um, which was, which was, you know, it's not a James period, but it was pretty amazing, um, to get that in the midst of the, the pandemic. I mean, that was really a, a game changer for us. It, it, it basically said, okay, you're going to make it when we got that. Um, hmm. And so, and then we're opening uh, La Belle Lame, um tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> Holy shit. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys go to bed or something? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys are keeping Jamie up past the Yeah. Time, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then we're going to open, <laughs> and it's true. It is true. Um, and then we're going to open uh, a restaurant in Nashville uh, called Church and Union, which is sort of like a, a new iteration of Five Church. Yeah. The evolution. Uh, the evolution of the brand. Um, and that'll be in the summer at some point. So that's, I mean, so DNC was in 2012, and now nine years later, you guys have kind of a, a Southeast restaurant empire of sorts. So, well, congrats on the success, I would say. Um, and I'm a yeah. fan. I was a fan of Nana Byron's, by the way. I Same know here. We, yeah. hear that, we hear that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I took my mother there multiple times and I think multiple third date spots. It was like a good third date. Can you please unpack yeah, that for yeah, us, please? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> First date is you can't guys spend less than like $14 like per meal. Like, and you got to be able to be in and out within an hour if needed or stay longer. Um, second date is generally park or something with introducing the dog if that works. Then the third date is a nicer spot, <laughs> but not too nice. Wow. The dog, I love it. The third date spot. The third date. Is <laughs> the, dog. the dog. That's why. That's why it didn't work out. Should have marketed it. Yeah. <laughs> it was just all people on third dates. <laughs> third dates and, and me spot. taking my mom. We're the proposal. We want to be we, the we, last we, date in the yeah. first when dream where dreams are made. Yes. <laughs> not that us. No. I'm glad it was for you guys. Um, <laughs> so I, obviously past year we've talked about it um I, I there's so many ways we could break it down and i'm sure you guys answer this a lot but i i guess like the first question i have is like what was the oh shit moment like what was when you guys what was that moment when you realized this isn't 
obviously this isn't normal, but things are going drastically different than we ever could have expected. That's a great question. Um, I think the oh shit moment, I mean, the oh shit moment for us came just, bef just before, um, you know, there was the, you know, mandatory lockdowns, you know, when they were like, Hey, we gotta, we gotta close stuff down. Um, you know, I think Pat had the foresight before that happened. Um, we, you know, we closed down like a week or two before it's like, it was ended up being like, I think six days, six four, days four or before six days. all that stuff happened. So like we, obviously we were watching everything unfold. I think um, we were on the phone constantly, like what the hell is going on? And, um, and I think, you know, Pat had the, the instincts that we should, shut our operations down and conserve as much capital as we could consolidate all the capital that we had any liquid that we had and get it, you know, stockpile it just to, to see what was going to happen. And, um, and I think once, once we did that, like that kind of drastic move, I was like, this, this shit is real. Like, I, I don't know what's going to happen next. Um, I mean, that was it for me. Um, you know, but I think for all of us, yeah, you know, I'll, let, was, you, I'll that, let you touch that on week that. Was, that. That week was that was the oh shit moment moment. But then the real the real kicker was like when we had to, you know, we had to lay off our staff. I mean, that was yeah, was, un unbelievably was depressing. Awful. I mean, I, I I felt like my world had just ended. For yeah, sure. I remember I, I was sitting and we just had moved into a, our brand new office, which we're still in now in um, in our in our building. So this is our corporate office. And uh, we had John Norris who painted the artwork on the ceiling, paint the wall and put all these logos up, but it was really beautiful. We spent a bunch of money on, on making it like a real office that we could grow into. Like a grown up office. A grown up, yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> okay, we won't get into that. But, um, but it, was, it was a real office. And, and like the next day, the stock market was going down 3000 points a day. And I sat in my office with um, Lauren Kearsley, who has worked for us since she was an intern at Butter. She's sort of our human resources slash everything person. And I looked at her and I was like, man, I, I, I really wanted, I really wanted to work in this office. Like, I really, yeah. I, I was like, this, we this whole thing's coming down, and, you know, and a lifetime in, in the industry building towards this was just like, I can't believe this is how it's going to end for us. Mm. I mean, honestly, I didn't, I didn't see any other way I mean, without, a lot of things going our way, we, we would not have made it. Um, yeah, we barely did. So, um, yeah, yeah, it was pretty, it's pretty rough. Yeah, I imagine. I mean, just we're we're just talking about kind of uh, uh, incredible success in a nine year span, and then all of a sudden, it's kind of like the exact opposite of that in in a matter of days and weeks, right? So, I, I can't imagine that. And I mean, just opening office space and kind of. Hey, this is great. We're gonna open office. This could be the future. And we, were, yeah. we were in construction at, at Tempest, though, and we were in construction in Nashville. Oh wow! I mean, it was just yeah. It Those was, plans were working. It, yeah, it was. It was thankfully, and this really was a, a real blessing. We we have a, a, a couple partners. Um, one guy named Mike, named Mike who, who is who were amazing uh, for us through this. Super supportive. Um, and you know we're super patient, and they understood. You know, and um, we were very lucky to have people like that have our back. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, I I hesitate to like skip through the year and like the ups and downs and kind of uh, uh, the kind of uncertainty that I'm sure you guys went to and, and all that, getting into kind of more reopening. But I definitely want to to make sure we talk about. Kind of the the tip the chef and the and the kind of uh, uh, new models you guys are thinking about, but kind of bring us up to maybe present day or or maybe like what's a big learning from the past year now that you guys have it seems like the boat has steadied a little bit. I, I don't want to put words in you guys' mouth, but it seems like you guys made it <laughs> and and it's it's looking like uh, uh, you guys will still be a thing. Uh, so what's kind of your, your biggest takeaway from the past year? How's it going now? And then kind of how do you see the industry differently? So that's three questions in a row, like kind of what, what's kind of the big, yeah. big learning? We'll, we'll, we'll tag team. Yes, you, you start. So, so I think, so segueing from the pandemic, okay, through that kind of the, the dramatic year of that, I think we all had some awakenings um, over the course of that year where we were reconsidering 
what we were doing, how we could do it, what our futures were going to look like. I mean, everything was on the brink of unraveling. And that jarred us in a way that it started some new lines of thinking. Hmm. And I think these lines of thinking were there for the year, for years. I mean, we've been closely working together for years, um, talking about, you know, where we're going next and what the future looks like and all this. But I think, um, I think that we realized how volatile um, the hospitality business is and that we were lucky to have survived it and that we needed to play some sort of role in um, re- rehabilitating it and strengthening it in a way where it could become um, a real strong um, uh, career again as a strong, hmm. you know, and, and I think that's where the, you know, tip the kitchen initiative, kind of the seed started. Um, and, you know, we wanted to, um, level the disparities between front and back of the house. Hmm. We felt like the teams that, that have busted their asses for people to, to take care of folks, to, um, you know, to show people hospitality in a good time, kind of got the raw end of the stick, you know, and we had to lay those people off, hmm. you know, and they didn't deserve that. And not only that, I mean, these people were making what we consider to be livable wages before that happened. And the fact that many of them stuck with us, I mean, we felt grateful that, yeah. that they would come back and work with us again. And we felt obligated to find a way to create a stable environment for our teams um, so that we could work inspired and work um, and just work better. You know, I think that's kind of yeah. where we're at right now. Yeah. Where we want to, where we want to move our businesses to and where we, I think we feel strongly that the future of the hospitality business is rooted in this. So, so economically like P and L perspective is this is the idea of tip the kitchen. I want you guys to talk about what that means in a second, certainly, but, but is that something that you guys always felt was kind of economically viable and you just never got around because you're busy expanding to kind of trying it out or kind of we having like, do, how many dollars do, 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 do podcasts for this yeah. one? This is bad. This is bad. <laughs> <laughs> Here. Maybe we can, maybe we need part. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I guess uh, let's build off what Jamie said, because I think this is really important is that, um, you know, Jamie and Alejandro and I in particular, um, we are very proud of the work that we've done over the last 10 years. Um, I think we've done some really, really incredible things in a relatively short period of time and, and moved the dial uh, on what people can expect when they go out to eat in Charlotte and now Charleston and be able to do that next in Nashville. That said, um, I know to a certainty that all three of us have some regrets in terms of the way that we ran our business. Uh, I, I have some very, very deep regrets. Um, and I think COVID really knocked the shit out of all th- three of us. We were actually all living together <laughs> in a house, a rental house in, in, in uh, Charleston and Isle of Palms. Uh, I mean, literally all three of us, all three of us and our family. my kids. My girlfriend, his girlfriend and their dog, my dog, and <laughs> everyone's favorite, Alejandro, was, I don't even know what room he was in, but um, he was on the couch <laughs> most of the time, but yeah. he bounced around. But, um, and there was just an amazing, I'm sure lots of people had this feeling during that, but there was this amazing solidarity that we had, you know, being in that kind of environment, kind of, it brought us back to where we started, which is, did we do this to make a fortune? Did we do this to, to get rich? Did we do this to, to, to be famous? Did we, you know, why did we do this? And um, I think we all did it in the beginning because we wanted to change the game. Hmm. We looked at the restaurant business in Charlotte, in particular at that time, although it's broader than that now. And we saw opportunities um, where other people um, were not filling the market. And, and we got to that point with COVID and, partner that with never ending existential dread for a year. I mean, you should, <laughs> by the end of it, you should have seen uh, us and me, especially, I was just, 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 just a bag of shit getting dragged for each day, <laughs> waiting for, waiting for 5 PM. So no more money could come out of our bank accounts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was so, it was so painful, but, um, but 
we looked at we looked at we we looked at where we were at the end of that and the fact that we survived and we really felt a deep sense of obligation, like Jamie said. And when I took a trip to Disney World with my family, um, we snuck away for a few days, and I got back and and uh, somebody was telling me a story about how one of our line cooks uh, had to borrow some money because he couldn't afford to eat because he was getting paid. You know, I think we're paying fourteen fifty dollars an hour. Yeah, and it made me. It, honestly, I don't know if you can curse in the show. It made me fucking ill. I, 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 I was disgusted with the industry. I was disgusted in our role in it. Um, hmm. I, I just, we, we don't want to live that way anymore. We couldn't. Hmm. And those realities, and there's a whole bunch that kind of came up, like, like Jamie said, I think it's below the surface, but it came up at the same time. We're like, we, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make a living doing something off other people that, that, that benefits yeah. from other people's pain. Yeah. I just, yeah. I, I, that's the opposite of hospitality. Mm-hmm. It's disgraceful. Um, and I'm going to have real regrets probably the rest of my life that we didn't do some of these things sooner. Right. Um, yeah. That's how we got there. Yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like the whole reason you guys got into the game of starting your own thing was experiencing a, a ceiling of sorts yourself, right? Yeah. Like, yep. as we yeah. get to ourselves. So no, that, that would make sense. Now you mentioned tip the kitchen and other things like so how have those come about obviously from this feeling that you had but what are those programs and how will people see those in your in your restaurants uh well i'll, 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 yeah. I'll do a quick i want you to talk about how it's impacted everybody but yeah but for, for i mean the 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 the, the challenge is, is for restaurants right now is that some huge percentage i've heard i've read 30 percent of the, of the of the restaurant workforce left and it's not coming back and that's it. That's an that's an incredible number if you think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a result, and it's not because of unemployment. It's not. Uh, that's all. That's all smokescreen. It's that there's a problem fundamentally with how restaurants are operated. They're operating with an enormous wage gap between the front house and the back of the house. There's there's um, tons of addiction issues all over the place. Um, uh, there's there's money questionable money actions all the time. It's just it's, it, everybody's seen. It seems to be constantly toxic. Um, and, and so we're like, all right, well, we need to go piece by piece and figure out, is there something that we can do? Cause we can control what happens in our stores to shift towards a, we'll say at least a less toxic environment, ideally a positive environment. Um, and the first one, the most glaring one was an economic problem where our front of house staff, and there's nothing wrong with them. They're amazing. But, you know, on a busy Saturday night, we're making $400, uh, over a shift. The people who are making the food for these servers, you, you know, we're making 15 bucks an hour, which comes out to you know, 100, whatever, 100 bucks a shift. Um, that's that's just that's crazily wrong. And um, so our prompt was our, our task was to figure out how do we how do we increase the money going to our kitchen staff while not decreasing the money to our service staff without raising prices and without burdening our customers and losing market share. That was the prompt. Those are the questions that, that, that had to be answered in some capacity. I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole yeah. damn thing right there. Yeah. Like that was it. That was the puzzle. Right. And, um, and I got, you know, hats off to Patrick. I mean, he's the one that cracked the Da Vinci code on this one. Like, I mean, seriously, like went into his like, you know, perfect mind, like, you know, all right, all right. <laughs> thing. it was like, start, I mean, seriously, like, I don't know that anybody's really figured it out like this. Um, and, you know, we're only, I mean, we're just over two weeks into it, you know, um, two and a half nine, weeks, 19 days. 19 days into it. And we are seeing, I mean, the morale in our team is, is out, of, out of this world. I mean, the, the, the back of the house, people are making money. Like we're talking about <laughs> real money, uh, money that they are proud to come to work for. Yeah. We're talking about kind of like, like real livable wages. I think we, I mean, on average, I think there's somewhere around. Is it close to twenty five dollars an hour? So if the, you average it out, the, the, the average the average employee for us makes a, is making a minimum right now of twenty one dollars and fifty cents an hour. That's the minimum. Minimum. And the average is more like between twenty five and thirty dollars an hour. And we've seen shifts where these guys are making over thirty dollars an hour, which is in our world, just for context, huge. It's not possible. It's I mean, you, no, no one makes at least not in North Carolina or South Carolina. Yeah. It doesn't happen. Period. Ever. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, like Jamie said, that, that 
we, we went from we went from I asked our CDC at uh, at Tempest this this guy Will Cammer, who apparently I'm going to mention in every podcast I do from now on. Um, <laughs> but I asked Will between January 1st and April 20 or April 15th, how many walk-ins did you get to work in the kitchen? How many people walked off the street and looked for a job? And he said, I think it was 15 or less. And I said, how many have you had in the last seven days? And he said, 10. Hmm. I mean, that's so in 17 weeks, we had 15 and in seven days, we had 10. And now we're so staffed up at Tempest that he's pushing everybody to five trips to Charleston and they're at like 95% staffed up. Wow. Now we're shipping those guys up to Charlotte. Come on, come to, to Charlotte. Help open, <laughs> help open LaBelle Helene to help yeah. fill up five trips to Charlotte, which five trips to Charlotte's almost completely staffed at this point. Yep. Um, it's, it's been, a, it's just a, it's a total game changer. I, yeah. I am, I, we have not done anything as impactful as this. Yeah. Uh, in our company's career, yeah. company's company's history, and Easy. I have never in my in my professional career. Yeah. That's that's awesome. I mean, I love that you guys have kind of the 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 whole story that you guys have gone through from like the way you started to now, kind of making that impact that you kind of set out to do is amazing. And I think when we talked about setting this up, I think we talked about doing a, a part two. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we can check back in and then we can get some, some 30 day numbers. That's some real yeah, data. Early. Yeah. We, I would, we'd love to, I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I, and I think the most important thing about this, I mean, not only is it financially like changing the game for our teams and all that stuff, and we're super proud of that. Um, but, you know, the most important thing to me is that walking around the kitchen, the team feels valued. Mm-hmm. Like these people, like you can, the, the inspiration that people are working with now, I mean, it, they're so much more productive. They're so much more inspired in the work that they're doing, whether they're washing dishes or prepping, you know, prepping a bunch of mirepoix or whatever, they're loving their job. And that yeah. feels great. And I'm super proud of that. That's what we always want. Yeah. That's what, we like, want. what we were looking yeah. for. How we do never, we work in We never figure out why we weren't getting there. Yeah. And, and we're inspired. Why isn't everybody else right. inspired? Right. Yeah. Um, and, and this seems to have unlocked that, yeah. you know, from the early, you know, data that we're collecting and, and just the experiences with our team. But, uh, yeah, I think circling back in, in a couple of weeks and, and taking a look at it, I'm, I'm excited to see where we're at. Happy to. Well, thanks so much, guys. Uh, this is a perfect ending because we're also running out of our free Zoom meeting. So if this cuts this <laughs> out, you know how cheap we are. Um, but this was phenomenal. We'd love to reach back. At, we'll, we'll definitely do a part two. There's so much more to, to get on it. Um, and learn. But thank you so much for your time. All right, we're back. John and Miller. Uh, I feel like they're on something. That seems like such a good idea. (laughs) It really is. I was reading, I was like pulled up media about it. I was reading articles and it's just like, it's overwhelmingly positive. Like, and it's funny, like they were talking about how they crack the code of like the kitchen. And it's like, why haven't people thought of this? Like it's it, like once they said it, it's like oh my, like a light bulb went off. Well, I think like it's just uh, like necessity is the mother of invention type situation, right? Like you're just kind of doing things because you've always do done them a certain way, or it's just kind of easier and you got bigger fish to fry. Like expansion, like think of all think like if you're trying to prioritize stuff and like the meteoric rise they've had over the past ten years, like that stuff's not going to crack the top five. Like taking chances like that isn't going to when you don't have to, like, is it going to be a priority? Um, so I don't know. We'll see. Like, like we were talking about, hopefully we'll, we'll check back in and hear that it's kind of going gangbusters and expanded other restaurants and stuff. Cause like they're, they've, it seems like they figured out how to solve a problem, which is awesome. Yeah. Pretty cool. Um, speaking of solving a problem, our lead, our first cheer is what John? Uh, well, I think we decided we wanted to cheer the city of Charlotte for moving to paper leaf bags from plastic leaf bags so i get like i just personally bought some plastic leaf bags from home depot the other day and i have until Mm -hmm. july 5th to use them um because that's when the city will stop collecting paper bags for leaves um and i think the more i read about this i thought it was a really interesting idea what's your take are you are you pro or anti I'm pro. Um, been working with this in our move. We used a guy to help set up our y- y- lawn. His name's Ken. He's one of my favorite people in the world because he has, he, I don't think he listens, 
Um, but his job is he literally drives around his truck and then people get out of his truck and mow lawns while he sits on his phone. He has like my dream job. Yeah. But I need to have a conversation with Ken now to make sure like I don't want to get fined by the city. But that's also yeah. the thing is like you don't want to catch that fine. And uh, there's gonna be some angry yeah, tweets, which be a lot. Angry... No, nah, people get yeah. caught by fine. They're, they're people, anybody on Twitter in Charlotte is following Joe Bruno, so they already know that they need to do it. So I mean, it's not gonna know. be people on Twitter that get fined. Uh, sure, um, sure. But I thought it was interesting. My initial thought was like, oh, that's like a straws thing, like environmentalist, whatever. But the, the tearing open, of, like, yeah, the tearing open more- that makes so much sense. So the the bags get torn easily. And when that happens, it's way less efficient for the guys toss them in the back of the truck. So they have to like split them with a knife and dump the contents of the bag into the truck, rendering the bag useless. But they can just toss the entire paper bag in. So I feel like the angle is not necessarily, and I guess it's better for the environment too, but it's not that's not the only benefit. It's not the only utility, right? It's more efficient. And I say hey. Cheers, Cheers to that. Nice job, John. Um, your jeer. I think this is one personal to you. Go ahead. <sighs> Streetcar's delayed again, man. Like, it was supposed to open April and May. It's now first week of May. And it's delayed again until August. And I feel like, <laughs> like the only re- way you need to know is if it's been delayed too many times. Is like, I didn't see anybody complaining about it. So, basically, everybody's just like so worn down. And so cynical about when the streetcar is going to open. That's like, oh, another five months. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Well, so, the good thing is about this stuff is that no one calls it a trolley anymore. Everyone now knows it's the streetcar that's broken. It's been in the news enough where it's ruined the trolley. It, now everyone knows it's the streetcar yeah, and knows how. I guess so. Trolley. Just like rote repetition. I guess so. I mean, I, I thought you were going to say, like, the good thing is there's been a global pandemic and, and like, Uptown is a ghost town. Yeah, right John, now, I would so. never say the global pandemic was a good thing. Oh, okay. Well, I thought you would. But anyway, so, I don't know. Maybe there'll be people in Uptown. Maybe maybe it'll be open just in time for uh, people in Uptown to return to office post-Labor Day. We'll see. There's an optimistic. <laughs> is that going to happen? Uh, I don't know. Probably. We should get a gamble pool on this. Like we should pick like the biggest companies and set dates and have people bet on when they actually go back. Um, but I don't know. That's a that's a slippery slope. Like, what do you say? Like gambling? Yes, state? it leads to a lot of bad things. No way. That's the future of the state of North Carolina. First of all, <laughs> um, what? <laughs> in terms of like filling like tax <laughs> revenue gaps, like once the stimulus <laughs> runs out, like man, the budget is going to need it's going to need dollars comes from somewhere. Uh, I disagree. It's, it's, there is. There's a far easier thing if you're in state of North Carolina. Uh, weed, yeah. yeah. Well, both of them. Like, why not? Let's let's uh, let's, let's lean it, You know, let's lean into the Roaring Twenties. That's what I say. Yeah, because um, nothing bad happened after the Roaring Twenties. Sports, uh, sports gambling is 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 lesser two evils. I say. I don't say Perfect. that at all. I say do both of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> that uh, is not an official statement by the Charlotte Podcast. That is from at the awesome. Charlie Walk okay. on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't we have a stance? Um, Never take a stand. Never take a stand. Yeah, that's yeah. That's what I learned. That's what I learned from Hamilton. You're such a leader. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You you figured out the right lesson of Hamilton. <laughs> I mean, uh, speaking of taking a stand, how do we wrap up our podcast now? I think we got to do that. I think we got to do the Tiger. The panther it's the tiger weird. the panther <laughs> I don't know the my growl my growl popped on last episode i think i definitely had the best did growl. yeah yeah did you did you iso it and make it your ringtone no you should do that's all the right. next step all right that's what you should strive for this week all right do we should right. we do our individual growls or do them together no let's do an individual i like it all right you want to go first or me i'll go first all and right. it'll be a tough act to follow all right you ready yep. <clears throat> Rawr, rawr, rawr.